In this lecture, we will review some common congenital heart diseases. Congenital heart disease can be broadly classified into cyanotic and acyanotic. Acyanotic congenital heart disease can be further subdivided into left to right shunts, obstructive lesions, and a miscellaneous group. Cyanotic congenital heart disease can be classified into those with decreased pulmonary blood flow and those with increased pulmonary blood flow. Left to right shunts include atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, and iotopulmonary window. One person can have more than one of these shunts. Large left to right shunts can induce the development of pulmonary hypertension and lead to reversal of shunt later. Then they develop cyanosis and is called Eisenmenger syndrome. Left to right shunts are subdivided into pre-tricuspid and post-tricuspid shunts. Pre-tricuspid shunts are atrial septal defects and partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, though the latter is often associated with an atrial septal defect. Post-tricuspid shunts are ventricular septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, and iotopulmonary window. Of these, iotopulmonary window has the highest chance of early development of pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger reaction. Obstructive lesions include pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis, and coarctation of iota. Miscellaneous group of acyanotic lesions include anomalous origin of left coronary artery from pulmonary artery or alkappa, congenital mitral stenosis, congenital mitral regurgitation, etc. Cyanotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow are those with tetralogy of fallow like physiology. Basically, all these conditions have reduced pulmonary blood flow due to subpulmonic obstruction. Other conditions in this group are double outlet right ventricle with ventricular septal defect and pulmonary stenosis, transposition of great arteries with ventricular septal defect and pulmonary stenosis, and single ventricle with pulmonary stenosis. Cyanotic congenital heart diseases with increased pulmonary blood flow are transposition of great arteries, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, trungus arteriosus, single ventricle without pulmonary stenosis, double outlet right ventricle without pulmonary stenosis. Congenital heart disease occurs at a rate of 0.8 per thousand live birth. They are common in premature babies with most of them having a patent ductus arteriosus. In mature babies, the commonest congenital heart disease is ventricular septal defect if bicuspid aortic valve is excluded. Maternal diseases like rubella can contribute to congenital heart disease. Peripheral pulmonary stenosis and patent ductus arteriosus are associated with congenital rubella syndrome. Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve has been described in infants of mothers who receive lithium therapy during pregnancy. Atrial septal defect is the commonest congenital heart disease in the adult, barring of course bicuspid aortic valve. AST being a post tricuspid shunt, development of pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger syndrome is delayed and survival to adult age group is common. Some even argue that pulmonary hypertension in AST is primary pulmonary hypertension which the individual was otherwise destined to develop. Pulmonary hypertension is likely to develop in AST with large left to right shunt of long duration, though the severity of pulmonary hypertension is variable. Suprasystemic pulmonary arterial pressures are possible in pre tricuspid shunts like AST, unlike in VST where the pressure can go only up to the systemic level. This is because the pressure in both ventricles get equalized in the presence of an unrestricted VST. Usual types of AST are the commonest ostium secundum AST and the less common varieties of ostium primum AST and sinus venosus AST. Sinus venosus AST can be subdivided into superior vena cava type and inferior vena cava type. The former is associated with partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage of the right-sided pulmonary veins 
to the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. Another rare type of AST is the coronary sinus type of defect near the opening of the coronary sinus. Second AST is in the region of the fossa ovalis. There is usually a good rim of tissue all around making it suitable for device closure. Sometimes there can be multiple defects or a sieve like intraatrial septum which is difficult to close with the device. An intraatrial septal aneurysm may be seen with a small defect at its apex. There is hardly any gradient between the atria in a large AST and the left to right shunt is due to the higher compliance of the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. At birth, the right ventricle is dominant and the compliance is low. Hence, the shunt in AST is well established only when the RV regresses. Therefore, AST used to be detected late compared to VST previously. But now, with ubiquitous availability of echocardiography, ASTs are often detected early in life. Bimodal pattern of cyanosis has been described in AST with mild cyanosis due to transient right left shunt in early life, which results and reappearance much later with the development of pH and Eisenmenger reaction. Second of ASDs can be familial and associated with first degree AV block. In the earlier era, since detection of ASDs were delayed, it was thought that they seldom close spontaneously. Now with more frequent early detection of AST by echocardiography in infancy, more and more cases of spontaneous closure have been reported. Smaller size of defect and early age of diagnosis are important predictors of spontaneous closure. ASTs of less than 3 mm size diagnosed before 3 months of age are expected to close spontaneously. Though ASTs more than 8 mm in diameter are unlikely to close, Cases on record in which 10 mm second AST close spontaneously within one year. There are reports of decrease in size of AST without complete closure. Reports of increase in size of AST over time are also there. This is the subcoastal view on echocardiogram showing a 15 mm AST. Left to right shunt in red color is seen across the AST in the right panel. AST with right left shunt in blue color on color Doppler echocardiography is seen in the right panel. Transient right left shunt can occur even without severe pulmonary hypertension due to phasic fluctuation of atrial pressures with respiration and valsalva maneuver. Such right left shunts can cause stroke due to paradoxical embolism. Paradoxical embolus is one from the right side of the heart reaching the left side of the heart and systemic circulation. Ostium primum AST is part of the AV canal defects. In partial AV canal defect, ostium primum AST is often associated with cleft anterior mitral leaflet producing mitral regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation may also be noted. In complete AV canal defect, there is associated canal VST or inlet VST and sometimes a single AV wall. Ostium primum AST being part of the endocardial cushion defects may be associated with Down syndrome. They are more likely to develop pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger syndrome earlier. Dijard syndrome and Ellis Van Krivel syndrome are the other conditions which can be associated with Ostium primum AST. Ostium primum AST is much rarer than Ostium secundum AST. Spontaneous closure is unlikely in ostium primum atrial septal defects. Echocardiogram from the apical four chamber view shows ostium primum AST seen in the left panel. It may be noted that both AV walls are at the same level. That is, there is no atrioventricular septum. There is no part of the septum between the AST and the AV walls unlike in secondum AST. Middle panel shows left to right shunt across the AST. Right panel shows bluish mesic tricuspid regurgitation jet. Left parasternal pulsations or heave indicate right ventricular enlargement or hypertrophy. Pulsations may also be felt in second left intercostal space due to dilated pulmonary artery. The region may be dull on percussion. Wide split second heart sound is the auscultatory hallmark of AST. 
This is because right ventricular output does not change significantly between inspiration and expiration. In expiration, when right ventricular output is expected to fall, increase in the left right shunt across the AST maintains RV output causing fixity of split. Wide split is because of delayed closure of the pulmonary wall due to increased hangout interval in a dilated pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary component of second heart sound may be loud if there is pulmonary hypertension. Ejection systolic murmur along left sternal border is another finding due to the increased flow across the pulmonary wall. A mid-diastolic tricuspid flow murmur may be heard with large shunts, especially in younger individuals. Pan-systolic murmur of TR is heard with pulmonary hypertension and in AV canal defects. Mitral regurgitation murmur may be associated in AV canal defects with cleft anterior mitral leaflet. Cyanosis may be seen if there is Eisenmenger reaction or sometimes with streaming of inferior vena cava flow by a prominent eustachian valve into the left atrium across the AST. Atrial fibrillation may be seen in adults. Atrial flutter can occur in AST even after repair. Inverted P waves seen in inferior leads indicate low atrial rhythm also known as coronary sinus rhythm in sinus venosus AST. This is due to defective sinus node as the septal defect is in the region of sinoatrial node. Classical QRS pattern in AST is the RSR prime in V1 suggestive of incomplete right bundle branch block. This pattern in AST is due to right ventricular volume overload. QRS axis is usually rightward more so when there is severe pulmonary hypertension. Left axis deviation is usually a feature of ostium primum AST. First degree AV block may be noted in both primum and secondum AST. Familial AST with first degree AV block has been reported in secondum AST. This type of familial AST has an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. There is also higher incidence of sudden cardiac death in this group. Notching of R wave near the apex in inferior leads has been called crochetage sign in AST. Crochetage sign has a sensitivity of 73% and specificity of 92% if the sign is present in all three inferior leads. Early disappearance of the crochetage sign after surgical correction of AST was found in 35% of cases even when incomplete RBBB pattern was persisting. Crochetage sign in AST manifests as notching of R wave near the apex in inferior leads marked by arrows. Sharp P waves in V1 and 3 mm tall P waves in lead 2 suggest right atrial overload. RSR prime S prime pattern in V1 is suggestive of right ventricular volume overload. When there is severe pulmonary hypertension in AST, right ventricular hypertrophy and strain patterns are manifest in the ECG. The secondary R wave in V1 is tall and ST segment depression with T inversion are found in anterior and inferior leads. ECG in AST with severe pulmonary hypertension. Tall R prime in V1, ST depression in inferior leads and V2 to V5 and T inversion in inferior leads and V1 to V6 are seen. The classical finding of chest x-ray in AST is pulmonary plethora due to increased vascularity. This is seen when there is a large left to right shunt. More than 5 endon vessels seen as circular shadows are also often noted. The main pulmonary artery is prominent along with right and left pulmonary arteries. The pulsations of prominent hilar pulmonary arteries on fluoroscopy has been called hilar dance. Right atrial enlargement occurs later manifest as a shift of the right border towards the right from the midline. In AST with large left right shunt, the cardiac apex is of RV type and upturned. When there is associated severe MR, a down and out LV apex may be noted. Chest X-ray in AST with pulmonary hypertension. Prominent main pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery are seen. Left pulmonary artery shadow is retrocardiac descending from the main pulmonary artery. Right atrial enlargement is visible. Cardiac apex is upturned suggestive of right ventricular apex. Endon vessels are also seen. 
Discussion on Patent for Aminoveil PFO Patent for Aminoveil is a wall opening in the fossa ovalis region of the interitreal septum. In fetal life, the foramen oveil shunts relatively more saturated inferior vena cava blood coming from the umbilical vein to the left atrium from the right atrium. This blood with higher oxygen level reaches the left ventricle and gets pumped to the upper part of the body including the brain. Superior vena cava blood streams to the right ventricle from the right atrium and reaches the pulmonary artery. As the lungs are non-functional, the blood from the pulmonary artery is shunted to the descending thoracic aorta through the ductus arteriosus from where it reaches the umbilical artery. Umbilical artery takes this relatively unsaturated blood to the placenta for oxygenation. Soon after birth, when the lungs start functioning, the pulmonary venous return increases left atrial pressure and the valvular foramen oval closes. In adult life, a partial propatency of foramen oval can be there in several cases, but shunting of blood is not common. If at all, it shunts from right atrium to left atrium during certain phases as with Valsalva strain. This transient right left shunt is responsible for occasional cases of paradoxical systemic embolism and stroke. This image captures the left to right shunt across a patent foramen oval from the subcostal view. RA right atrium, LA left atrium, PFO patent foramen oval. A PFO which shunts left to right without significant elevation of left atrial pressure can also be technically called a small atrial septal defect. Conventionally, PFO is a valvula opening which closes when the blood tries to flow from left atrium to right atrium. In certain phases of the cardiac cycle or during a Valsalva maneuver, right to left flow of blood can occur across a PFO. This is thought to be the mechanism of paradoxical embolism and stroke in case of PFO. Left to right shunt can occur across a stretched open PFO when the right or left atrium enlarges due to another pathological condition which elevates the left atrial pressure. In this case, there was an associated ventricular septal defect, but the size of the defect and the magnitude of shunt across the VST was not sufficient enough to produce volume overloading of the left-sided chambers. If there is spontaneous left to right shunt throughout the cardiac cycle, the defect is better considered as a tiny atrial septal defect rather than a PFO. The reason is that PFO by definition is a valvular opening which permits shunting only right to left. PFO shunts can be detected by saline contrast echocardiography in which agitated saline is injected into a peripheral vein. If the contrast appears in the left atrium within three cardiac cycles, it is suggestive of right to left shunt across the PFO. Transesophageal echocardiography may be better for the demonstration of PFO because of higher resolution. Transcranial Doppler studies will document these bubbles reaching the brain and hence the possibility of paradoxical embolism and stroke in case there is deep vein thrombosis. PFOs have also been associated with migraine-like symptoms. Whether these are also related to paradoxical emboli has to be considered. PFO closure has been recommended for the secondary prevention of stroke as well as for primary prevention of stroke in case of transient ischemic attacks. PFO closure device is similar to the AST closure device but differs in two aspects. The right atrial disc is larger unlike the AST device. The connecting piece between the two discs is of much lesser diameter compared to an AST device. The technique of device delivery is similar to that of an AST device closure. Device closure is done under fluoroscopy in the cath lab with guidance of device position by transesophageal echocardiography. Management of patients with patent foramen oval and cryptogenic stroke has been reviewed by Abdel Ghani and colleagues. They have reviewed multiple trials and meta-analysis of PFO device closure and given an algorithm. Common associations of a PFO are 1. Eustachian valve 2. Shayari network 3. Atrial septal aneurysm
Eustachian valve is at the opening of the inferior vena cava into the right atrium and tends to direct the inferior vena cava blood across the patent foramen ovale. It is a remnant of the embryonic right valve of the sinus venosus. Shiari network, also a remnant of the right valve of the sinus venosus, is a network of filamentous structures sometimes seen in the right atrium. Atrial septal aneurysm is located in the fossa ovalis region where the septum primum overlies the septum secundum. It has been implicated in the pathogenesis of cryptogenic stroke. Though there was a significant correlation between septal excursion distance and infarct volume, in a study, 12 patients with atrial septal aneurysms did not have the largest strokes. Discussion on atrial septal defect with bidirectional shunt on echocardiogram. Subcostal force chamber view shows a large defect in the intraatrial septum. Right atrium and right ventricle are dilated while left atrium and left ventricle are not. Blue color on color flow mapping indicates right to left shunt across the atrial septal defect in the subcostal view as the flow is away from the transducer. This image shows red colored flow across the AST indicating a left to right shunt. In addition, there is a mosaic multicolored jet spreading from the closed tricuspid valve into the right atrium due to tricuspid regurgitation. Bidirectional shunt can occur in AST even without pulmonary hypertension. This is because transient right to left shunt can occur in certain phases of respiration and valsalva maneuver. The volume of that right to left shunt is so small that there will not be any clinical cyanosis. Still, there is a small risk of paradoxical embolism. But here, there is severe pulmonary hypertension which has caused reversal of shunt, though some left to right shunting is also persisting. As the pulmonary hypertension progresses, the shunt may become fully right to left. Bidirectional shunts in uncomplicated AST has been described by Galway and colleagues. They noted this in older patients unrelated to pulmonary hypertension and considered it to be a sequel of chronic right ventricular volume overload. Shunts were determined by measuring the pulmonary vein to systemic artery oxygen step down. Bidirectional shunting across the AST on Doppler echocardiogram along with right ventricular hypertrophy and systolic flattening of the interventricular septum are generally considered as features of pulmonary hypertension. When the shunt is bidirectional, effective pulmonary blood flow can be equal to systemic blood flow. QP by QS is equal to 1. QP by QS will be less than 1 when the shunt becomes purely right to left. Both are suggestive of Eisenmenger physiology in the presence of pulmonary hypertension. Transesophageal echocardiogram is useful in the evaluation of AST to assess the finer details while deciding on device closure. It is also useful in delineating ASTs which are not visible by transthoracic echocardiography either due to poor echo window or due to odd location of the AST as in sinus venosus AST. TEE is often used in this context while evaluating pulmonary hypertension of obscure etiology in adult. TEE probe being very near the heart without any intervening lung tissue can give excellent images. Moreover, the short distance permits the use of higher frequency transducers with better image resolution. Usually, higher frequency transducers cannot be used for transthoracic echo because of poor depth of ultrasound penetration at higher frequencies in an adult. AST seen on transesophageal echo. TEE image in short axis view showing the aorta, part of the intraatrial septum and the AST. It can be seen that there is hardly any aortic rim, that is a bald aortic rim. Part of the left atrium is seen above the IAS. Below the IAS, the large right atrium is visible. Dual ASTs with a small intervening segment of atrial septum seen on TEE. The right atrium appears dilated. Total size of both ASTs taken together is quite large and not suitable for device closure. This image displays the measurements of both ASTs. 
one measures 17.5 mm and another measures 15.6 mm. The total will be 33.1 mm. The rims at both ends also appear deficient so that the device closure may not be a feasible option in this case. Surgical closure will be ideal provided that there are no features of irreversible pulmonary hypertension. Device closure of AST is suitable for secondum AST with a good rim all around for holding the discs together. Transesophageal echo is done to assess the superior aortic and mitral rims as well as the total septal length. It is ideal to have TEE guidance during the procedure as well. A guide wire is introduced through the femoral vein into the inferior vena cava and further through the right atrium across the AST into the left atrium. The tip of the wire is then placed in the pulmonary vein and a long venous sheath is introduced. Once the sheath is in position, the device attached to the delivery cable is introduced into the sheath under water to avoid air bubbles in the system. Bubbles in the system can get embolized during delivery with air emboli going into the systemic circulation. If it reaches the cerebral circulation, transient giddiness and altered sensorium can occur. ST segment elevation and hypotension may occur if the air bubbles find their way into the coronary circulation. Oxygen inhalation and other supportive care usually takes care of minor air embolism as the manifestations are often transient. Once the device reaches the left atrium, the left atrial disc of the device is released first and brought in contact with the left atrial side of the AST. When the position is judged ideal, the right atrial disc is allowed to form by withdrawal of the sheath. Once the two discs are in position with the waist across the AST, slight wiggling is done to make sure that the device is perfectly fitting and has no tendency for dislodgement. Position is confirmed by transesophageal echo with special care to see that the device does not interfere with the function of the AV walls. Once everything is fine, the device is released by unscrewing the delivery cable. An unstable device can occasionally get dislodged either into the left or right atrium. It may be possible to snare out the dislodged device depending on the position where it gets lodged. Rarely, surgical intervention may be needed to retrieve a dislodged device. One of the dreaded long-term complications of AST device closure is aortic erosion which is more likely to occur if the aortic rim is deficient. Fortunately, it is very rare due to precautions at the time of device implantation and pre-implant assessment. A study published in Circulation in 2016 documented 125 cardiac erosions over a period of 12 years from a database. Erosions were diagnosed over a median of 14 days after the device closure. Deficiency of aortic rim was found to be almost universal while deficiency of any of the aortic superior vena caval or inferior vena caval rims were the most important risk factor for cardiac erosion. It was a case control study with age and sex matched controls. Device oversizing also contributed to the chance for cardiac erosion after AST device closure. Those who died of cardiac erosions were more likely to have aortic erosion than the survivors and an oversized device. Though the median period was 14 days, 16 of the 125 erosions were diagnosed after one year. Other factors related to erosion were larger size of the AST, larger size of the device, smaller weight bar device size ratio and more than 5 mm difference between the AST size and device size. Generally, closure of AST is done in children and young adults. A study involving 23 patients with AST and median age of 70 years having AST size between 9 to 30 mm reported favorable cardiac remodeling and improvement of functional status. The New York Heart Association functional class improved in 16 patients. They had significant improvement in 6 minute walk distance and mental health score. No major complications were noted in these AST device recipients. They also had significant change in the left ventricular and diastolic 
and end systolic dimensions at one year after the closure. There was accompanying significant reduction in right ventricular end diastolic dimensions as expected. The improvement of LV function was due to offsetting of the reverse Bernheim effect in which RV dilatation causes a septal bulge and impedance to LV function. Though some studies have shown transient increases in left atrial pressure and consequent pulmonary edema in elderly patients after AST closure due to a stiff LV, the current study did not report any such instance. The authors concluded that AST closure with devices is technically feasible and is associated with favorable cardiac remodeling and improvement in functional class in older patients. Perimembranous ventricular septal defect is the most common variety. Other types are inlet VST, outlet VST and muscular VST. Parasternal long axis view showing right and left ventricles, left atrium and iota. Perimembranous VST is seen just below the aortic wall. It is subiotic in location. Size of VST is compared to the aortic diameter. Here it is a small VST as it is less than one third of aortic diameter. Still frame from parasternal long axis view in perimembranous VST showing the color jet from the subiotic region of left ventricle to the right ventricle. Color sector in parasternal long axis view shows the mosaic multicolored VST jet across the perimembranous VST from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. It is a high velocity jet because VST is restrictive. The neck of the jet almost corresponds to the size of the VST. Perimembranous VST jet on continuous wave Doppler interrogation. It is a high velocity jet indicating large gradient between the ventricles. High velocity jet is noted in restrictive VST. Small VST is also known as Melody the Roger. In large VST, the gradient is low as the pressure in the ventricles equalize. Apical five chamber view showing the subiotic perimembranous ventricular septal defect. Sometimes it may be associated with aortic regurgitation, though not seen in this case. Color Doppler imaging in apical five chamber view showing the left to right shunt across the subiotic ventricular septal defect into the right ventricle. Still frame in apical five chamber view showing the VST jet. Echocardiogram in a tilted apical four chamber view showing all four cardiac chambers RA right atrium, RV right ventricle, LA left atrium, LV left ventricle. The perimembranous ventricular septal aneurysm with defect is marked by arrow in the left panel. Right panel shows the reddish mosaic multicolored jet through the ventricular septal defect. This echocardiogram in apical five chamber view shows the mosaic multicolored jet of a small ventricular septal defect near the apex. The cardiac chambers are not dilated. The small defect is difficult to see on 2D echo though it is easily detected clinically with a pan systolic murmur and Doppler echo documents the high velocity jet across the VST. Continuous wave Doppler interrogation shows the interventricular pressure gradient as 81 millimeters of mercury which is consistent with a restrictive VST. Small muscular VSTs like this are likely to close spontaneously on follow-up. They will not cause pulmonary hypertension or heart failure and usually have good prognosis unless complicated by infective endocarditis. Natural history studies have shown that small muscular VSDs have a high likelihood of spontaneous closure. Spontaneous closure occurred in 76% cases by 12 months of age in one study. But epical defects tend to have a higher persistent patency rate than defects in other locations. P-value less than 0.05. Long-term course of 600 small and moderate muscular VSDs diagnosed over a six-year period has been reported by Eric L. Shelby Kuti and Associates. They found that though pediatric cardiology follow-up was recommended, these did not result in any significant active medical or surgical management. Of the 316 follow-up visits recommended, only 259 happened 
though there were 37 other unplanned follow-up visits. 85% of this cohort had small muscular VSD on initial echocardiogram. Intramural VSD is a type of residual VSD seen after repair of complex defects like double outlet right ventricle, trungus arteriosus or rastily procedure for transposition of great arteries. The intramural VST originates between the insertion of the VST closure patch and the aortic valve. The defect occurs because coarse trabeculae of the hypertrophied right ventricle prevents good seal at the site of patch insertion. So blood can tunnel through the trabeculae from the left ventricular outlaw tract into the right ventricle through its wall. Due to the peculiar location, it is often difficult to image intramural VSTs properly both by transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography. High parasternal views on transthoracic and deep transgastric views on transesophageal echocardiography are often needed for delineation of the intramural VSTs. Defects can increase in size over time and more shun can be established. These shunts may be difficult to eliminate by surgical repair and contribute to morbidity and mortality after repair of conotrunkal anomalies. A study published in Circulation confirmed that intramural VSTs in addition prolong the postoperative hospital stay and need for ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. In their series of 442 subjects, 256 had residual VSTs of which 49 were intramural VSTs. Since these VSTs are not accessible through atriotomy or right ventriculotomy, transiotic closure has been advocated. Another study found 34 intramural VSTs in 337 patients who underwent biventricular repair of conotrunkal anomalies. 19 were identified both by postoperative transthoracic and intraoperative transesophageal echocardiography. 15 were identified only by postoperative transthoracic echocardiography. Intraoperative transesophageal echocardiography had a sensitivity of 56% and specificity of 100% for identifying intramural VST. Many of the intraoperatively detected defects could be closed fully or partially, but not all. Four cardinal features of tetralogy of fallow are malalignment ventricular septal defect, overriding aorta, infundibular pulmonary stenosis, and right ventricular hypertrophy. The variability in clinical presentation of TOF correlates with degree of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and the size and anatomy of pulmonary artery and its branches. They usually present with cyanosis in childhood. Squatting on exertion and cyanotic spells are classical symptoms of TOF. The lifted up apex, core and sabo, peasant's boot shaped heart due to the right ventricular hypertrophy is seen well in this chest x-ray PA view. The right sided aortic arch is seen indenting the tracheal air column on the right side. There is mild cardiomegaly and right atrial enlargement as well in this adult person with tetralogy of fallow and associated inferior wall myocardial infarction. The lung fields are oligemic due to the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction in tetralogy of fallow. Tetralogy of fallow is the commonest cause of right aortic arch in an adult. Color Doppler echo in TOF. The blue color is the flow of blood from right ventricle across the ventricular septal defect into the overriding aorta. This causes desaturation of aortic blood and cyanosis in tetralogy of fallow. The blood from the right ventricle preferentially enters the aorta which is overriding the ventricular septal defect because right ventricular outflow tract is narrowed in tetralogy of fallow as a result of infundibular pulmonary stenosis. Parasternal long axis view in tetralogy of fallow, diastolic frame showing the aortic valve in closed position and mitral valve in open position. The aortic valve appears to impinge on the ventricular septum but the ventricular septal defect with aortic override and connection between right ventricle and aorta is evident just above the septum. Apical five chamber view in tetralogy of fallow demonstrating the sub aortic ventricular septal defect with aortic override. 
50 percent of the aorta is committed to the left ventricle while the remaining half is committed to the right ventricle. The VST in Tetralogy of Fallow is a malalignment VST which results from the malalignment of the ventricular septum with respect to the articopulmonary septum during embryonic development. The shift of the articopulmonary septum towards the pulmonary side produces both the ventricular septal defect and the narrowing of the right ventricular outflow tract. Anne Prague and colleagues hypothesized that all the features of Tetralogy of Fallow are due to the underdevelopment of the infundibular septum and its sequelae. They termed this as a monology called by others as Van Pragg's monology of fallow. Epical five chamber view in Tetralogy of fallow with color flow mapping in systole with right to left shunt across the ventricular septal defect. Blue stream moving from the right ventricle across the VST to the aorta is clearly visualized in this frame. There is also a blue stream from the left ventricle to the aorta. Color flow imaging shows high velocity jet in the pulmonary artery arising distally from the descending aorta suggesting a patent ductus arteriosus. This is one of the compensatory mechanisms to improve pulmonary flow in tetralogy of fallow. Another mechanism is major aortopulmonary collateral arteries or MAPCA. Intrapulmonary collaterals can also occur in tetralogy of fallow. The image is in the parasternal short axis view. Continuous wave Doppler interrogation of the jet guided by color flow mapping picks up the continuous flow with a peak gradient of 61.5 mm of mercury. The gradient is calculated from the velocity measured by the device using the formula P equal to 4V squared. Findings to be sought in an iotogram in Tetralogy of Fallow are aortic regurgitation, coronary anomalies, MAPCAS, PDA, and side of the aortic arch. Still frame from an angiogram with radio contrast dye injected using a pigtail catheter kept in the right brachiocephalic artery showing major aortopulmonary collateral artery arising from the right internal mammary artery. MAPCAS are seen in severe forms of tetralogy of fallow and pulmonary atresia. MAPCAS usually arise from the descending aorta. Strictly speaking, the collateral arising from right internal mammary artery is not a major iotopulmonary collateral though it can be considered a MAPCA in the wider sense of the meaning. When the lungs are supplied by multiple MAPCAs, they are unifocalized prior to definitive surgical repair of tetralogy of fallow. Connecting the distal end of MAPCAs to a single vessel is known as unifocalization. Collaterals to the pulmonary arterial branches can also arise from the bronchial arteries within the lungs. Hylar collaterals can also occur in pulmonary atresia. Surgical approaches to TOI would include palliative systemic pulmonary shunts like Blalock toxic shunt, water stent shunt and pot shunt. Complete repair is accomplished by patch VST closure, resection of the subpulmonic obstruction, a transannular patch around the pulmonary valve annulus if necessary and a takedown of prior shunt. Placement of a transannular patch for widening of the RVOT usually leads to severe pulmonary regurgitation. Systemic pulmonary shunts lead to high flow through the pulmonary artery, elevated pulmonary vascular resistance and branch pulmonary artery distortion. Survival after repair is worse in patients with prior central shunts that is water stent or pots, possibly due to the higher unrestrictive pulmonary blood flow. Some patients with Blalock toxic shunts may survive unrepaired into adulthood. These patients should be evaluated for pulmonary artery stenosis and pulmonary hypertension. Those who had pulmonary wall atresia or anomalous left anterior descending coronary artery may have had prosthetic or homograph conduits with or without a wall placed between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Endothelial overgrowth can occur within the conduit and cause obstruction of the right ventricular outflow tract. This can be treated with balloon dilatation or surgical replacement of the conduit. Pulmonary regurgitation is almost universal after corrective repair of tetralogy of fallow, more so in those who require a transannular patch for widening of the right ventricular outflow tract. 
Hence, an early diastolic murmur along the left sternal edge following repair of tetralogy of fallow is most often due to pulmonary regurgitation. But a few cases may also develop aortic regurgitation due to various reasons. Iota is dilated in tetralogy of fallow prior to repair because it receives a major portion of the output from the right ventricle as well as the left ventricular output. This is the reason for a high volume pulse in tetralogy of fallow. Thus, dilatation of the aortic root is one of the potential reasons for aortic regurgitation in tetralogy of fallow. Other causes are lack of support due to a sub-aortic ventricular septal defect and valvular deformation resulting from retraction of the surgical patch. The risk of sudden cardiac death in operated tetralogy of fallow is 25 to 100 fold than in the general population and it can occur decades after correction. The risk is related to QRS duration more than 180 milliseconds. QRS widening is related to pulmonary regurgitation, right ventricular dilatation and conduction defect. Atrial arrhythmias are also common after TOF repair. Hemodynamic effects of pulmonary regurgitation include chronic right ventricular volume overload, right ventricular dysfunction and exercise intolerance. Pulmonary wall replacement can decrease QRS duration and stabilize right ventricular function though the timing is unclear but earlier would be better than later. Right ventricular function can be evaluated by echo or magnetic resonance imaging. It is well known that adults with previously operated tetralogy of fallow can develop ventricular tachyarrhythmias and die suddenly. They are prone for ventricular tachycardia as well as atrial tachyarrhythmias like atrial flutter and fibrillation. Syncope may be a forerunner of sudden death in some individuals with operated tetralogy of fallow and calls for evaluation. An annual incidence of 0.4% sudden death during the first 25 years after surgery has been reported. Both the surgical scar as well as the dilatation of the right ventricle and right atrium due to the pulmonary and tricuspid regurgitation are thought to have roles in arrhythmogenesis. Highest risk is in those with marked cardiomegaly with cardiothoracic ratio more than 60%, severe pulmonary and or tricuspid regurgitation, QRS duration on the electrocardiogram of more than 180 milliseconds, and a QT interval dispersion of more than 60 milliseconds. Surgical correction of the pulmonary regurgitation with the valvular prosthesis and tricuspid regurgitation by anuloplasty may decrease the chance of atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. This is more likely if surgical repair is also accompanied by mapping and ablation of the re-entry circuit of the arrhythmia.